Hello everyone and welcome to another Nelson's Corner. Now picking up where we left off at the end of the last Nelson's Corner, in this video Nelson and Zach will be explaining how Magic the Gathering, that particular card game, works using the Magic Workstation software that we have here. So with that I'm just going to turn it over to you guys and be prepared for me to ask questions if I get confused. Okay, well... <laughs> uh uh, well, let me just, I'll just start off real quick. Uh, of course, in the last video, we did cover the interface. If you skip the end of the last video, uh, it's fine. Uh, it, I'm just, uh, I, I realized Jason was actually getting on to me for having my mouse over on the other He was screen. pointing to stuff on the other monitor. It was pretty funny. Yeah, but I was just kind of generically saying, um, if you did skip the end of the last video and you don't know what you're looking at, please go back and watch the previous video. Now, with that, Nelson, would you like to go ahead and get us going? Yeah, I just want to talk uh, just like a few seconds about the decks that we have here, just okay. a little bit. Um, just because normally when you get, I, I want to throw out a disclaimer here, normally when you get a starter magic, magic deck, they don't construct them to be very complex. And I personally don't like that that form of teaching magic. And I've taught magic to a lot of different people. And I, I think the starter decks usually sort of betray the intricacies of the game and how or how well how fun it could be more or less the starter decks usually turn out just to be you know whoever has the biggest creature out first wins the game essentially so this, these this is true uh, this is something i just, I just want to kind of concur with that a lot of the starter decks i've played with it's really just a matter of get some creatures out let the creatures bang on your opponent until they're dead and you're done which uh it kind of sells the game magic short and i can really see a lot of people who start off in magic going oh so it's like pokemon i just get a bunch of creatures out and go bang on some people's heads and then it's over and the answer is absolutely not there are all kinds of very subtle and intricate ways where magic can become a lot more interesting and i think that's what uh, nelson has tried to assemble here with these two decks yep and these are both decks that i used to play in tournaments too and they didn't do too well, but they're pretty evenly matched against each other. <laughs> well, they, yeah, so, you, they both suck you realize, equally. You realize you go to a Magic tournament, and a lot of the people who go there usually just get deck lists off StarCityGames.com from like the, the biggest leagues. They buy all the cards, and then they play them at tournaments to win. Right. That doesn't I sound never, very fun, then. Yeah, oh, I didn't but, really But like it sounds that. just like World of Warcraft, in a way, <laughs> where people just look up the best builds for their character, and what's the best rotation, and what's the best armor, and so you just work to get that, and then you're like, you know, maximum ponage. True, though I have known people to do that, but they were still idiots at being able to and you know, stay aware of their surroundings. And, and trust me, the same thing can be said in Magic the oh, Gathering. Good. Even if oh, you have... Yeah. Even if you have a brilliant deck, if you don't know how to play it and you don't know how to leverage the cards against one another, you're still screwed. Okay, you're, good. You're going to die. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. yeah. All right. I, I also do want to point out before we start drawing is that there is a level of randomness in Magic, and that's usually the, the your starting hand, usually. I mean, the, the way the, de the decks originally shuffled. And that is, it's not like to the point where it makes the game unfair or, you know, just a, like flipping a coin. Yeah. But it does get to the point where you will sometimes get bad draws, and we might get bad draws here. So Absolutely. It, it, what Nelson is trying to say is it's not all skill. Sometimes you will just have bad luck in the cards that you pulled out. Even if you know every card in the deck, it's very likely occasionally you'll get a card that you just don't need right now. And uh, you, you, sh you really wish you would have got another card out of it, or maybe you'll get something incredibly useful, and suddenly you kill the opponent ten times faster than you thought you would. Gotcha. So uh, there's a little bit of flip-flop, where sometimes it'll go really well for you, and sometimes it won't. The, the complexity and strategy that goes into building a deck, the execution of that deck, and the little bit of randomness are, like I think, the three key components of what makes, makes magic fun for me, personally. Okay. So, yeah. Well, with that, I think we can go ahead and draw our initial hands. Well, first of all, we need to flip a coin. Oh, okay. Well, you flip a coin. I will flip a coin. Nobody oh, called it. Nobody <laughs> called it. I, mean, you I was just about to ahead. say, that was kind of pointless. Uh, no, actually, what Nelson was doing there, I'll save you. Don't worry about it. Just relax. I'll save you. Uh, what Nelson was doing there is just allowing you to see how to flip a coin in, uh, in Magic Workstation. So I'll call it, and I'm going to call heads. And okay. you said flip coin and tails. tails. So you win. And that means I go first. Actually, what that means, according to the rules, is you choose who goes first. Because sometimes you might want it's to be true. the person who goes true. second. And it, paying attention to those little intricacies is very important in the game. So the first step is, let's say, we pretend that magic works. Real, real quick, table. real quick. Is there an advantage to going first? There could be, depending on the kind of deck you have. Well, I, I can throw this out. The person who goes first does Gets not cards. draw a card. 
The okay. person who goes second gets to draw a card first thing. Okay. Yep. So, but you know, the person who goes first already has a land, may have a land out in play, or may, basically they got the jump on them. Uh, it, it's possible you could, and you'll see in a moment what a land card is and kind of how that works. So I'm just going to say something that might make little sense to you. But uh, it's possible in your very first hand, you get a land card out, and you're able to cast a spell to injure your opponent on the very first round. Hmm. Okay. Oh, in old forms of magic, entire games were played in the first two turns. Wow. That's true, I, and I remember those days very well. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, Black when, Lotus, especially, yep. one of the, the most famous banned cards allowed you to win the game on the first turn. Back before they uh, banned the channel spell, I, still, I actually had a red and green deck with channel. I'm just saying. Okay, so now that you've won, you've decided you're going to go first, what do you do? Okay, so the first step is we, okay, so like Zach already said, this 60 represents a stack of 60 cards of our assembled decks. And I'm going to go ahead and draw seven cards. Actually, well, we're both going to draw seven cards. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do, and this is uh, just for those out there who are watching the game, uh, you know, uh, it's going to affect how Nelson plays, and that's just how it works. Uh, but I'm going to reveal all of the cards in my hand just so that everybody can see them. And what I'm doing, and you guys can't see this, is I'm right-clicking on each card, and there's a little mark, uh, menu that pops up that allows me to say reveal card. So now you can see everything that I have, and actually so can Nelson. Whether that's wise or not, we don't yet know. Um, but this does allow me to uh, illustrate one very cool rule about Magic the Gathering. Oh, actually, no, I've, I've got a forest. Uh, but since we did just draw, I'll go ahead and throw this out. There is such a thing. I was about to. I oh. was about to explain this exactly, because look at my hand. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm mana swamped. Um, but yeah, there is, a, there is a feature of the card game where you can do what's called mulliganing where you discard, well, you don't discard, you shuffle your hand back into your library, and then you draw one fewer card. So if I were to mulligan right now, I would shuffle my hand into my library, and then I would draw six cards. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and do that, because I got a lot of mana and very few... Now, you say you got a lot of mana, but what... I got what a you, lot of land. Yeah, you got a lot of land cards, and you can see those down there at the bottom of the screen. He's got a plains card and a forest card and a plains card and a forest card and a plains card. Okay. Uh, that's a lot of land. Oh, that's good. I like what he's doing now. He's clicking on it on the upper right in the interface. You can see basic land. Yeah. Basic land. Okay. And that's a lot of land to have in an opening hand. And really, I think in this case, it's just a matter of personal preference. I mean, I've, I've had opening draws where I do get a lot of land when I start out, but then it's like over the next several draws off the top of the deck, I don't get any. So it's, it's just a matter of, you know, do you think you've got too much and do, would it be better for you to mulligan? Okay. Total personal preference. And I'm going to go and do that. So I'm going to right click. Right click in this gutter area and say mulligan. And so now you see that I have six cards and I have a different hand and my library has been reshuffled. Um, if you look now, now I have three basic lands and three other cards. So yeah. I'm going to go ahead and keep this, uh, keep this um, hand. I mean, can you keep mulliganing over and over and over? Yeah, and you'll until get fewer you and fewer cards. cards until you oh, have no okay. cards left and then you or can't no mulligan anymore. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, so I guess I'm going to exp or we're going to jointly explain the steps as we go through them. And the first step that I'm on is the untap step, and that's kind of irrelevant because we just started the game. When I start the game, I kind of ignore these three steps because there's absolutely nothing that they could do. Can I throw? Some, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something really quick, and um, Nelson, you're just you're gonna have to bear with me real quick. Not acceptable. Uh, I know. Uh, here's what I'm gonna do. Do you remember all the cards that I had? Like a good. Howling Mine, an Excavator, Okay, fog. yeah, good, good. Then you don't remember all of them, but you remember a few. What I'm going to do is on my turn, I'm going to bring my screen over here and show you what I'm going to do. Okay. The neat thing about doing that is that Nelson never gets to see what's in my hand. Now, I'm cheating. I can see what's in his. Yeah. But he's a better Magic player than I am, mm -hmm. so it, it actually works in my favor, and it kind of balances the game slightly. So, um, Nelson... Please, and besides, this is what people will see when they uh, when they play each other anyway. Right. So, uh, please, it is your turn. Go ahead and let's let's go through the phases of a turn. Okay. So the first phase um, that I'm going to be on, uh, we're going to talk about. I guess Zach is going to talk about these three because he's going to actually execute these three. I'm going to start on my pre-combat main phase, and there's two main phases. And the main phases are when you can play lands, you can 
cast creature spells, summon creature spells. You can play other s- sorts of what are called permanents, such as enchantments and artifacts. And you can play sorceries. And those are the, the types of the cards that I just named, of the things that you can play during this turn. And I know I haven't actually defined what playing means or what constitutes playing or how you play a card, but just know that during your two main phases is when you can play the majority of your cards. It's where you sort of do your thing. Well, I, I, I also want to mention, uh, you'll notice that when Nelson actually clicked on the uh, the phase button in the upper right-hand corner, there's a really nice generic description to help you kind of see what it is you can and can't do during each phase. Okay. Oh, I totally noticed that. Yeah, it, it's just a way to, to keep it a lot simpler if you're... Uh, if you're, you know, really, really starting so out. the two main phases are going to be pre-combat and combat? That's right. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a forest by double-clicking on it, and it's now going into the battlefield. And no, notice that Magic Workstation, when I play a card, it, just like Zach described, there's sort of like a an unspoken rule about how you're supposed to organize your cards. Magic Workstation will actually pick up on the type of card and put it in the proper area. I mean, I could uh, drag pro- it yeah. the Yeah. Proper has finger quotes in this case. Uh, yeah, you can, could be anything. Right. So generally your lands go at the bottom of the battlefield. And lands are pretty much one of the most important things about magic, I guess. They're how you get energy, or well, mana, in order to cast spells. Okay. And that's sort of what you do with a, with a land is that you tap it by double-clicking on it in Magic Workstation. Um and what happens is, is my mana pool then gets incremented by however much this land gives out and of what color this land is. Now, how many colors of mana are there in Magic the Gathering? There's five. Those being? Um, there's white, green, black, red, blue. Okay. Now, I do want to mention in this particular uh, pair of decks that we are using... I have a white and blue deck, and I believe Nelson's using white and green. So there's not a whole bunch of variety amongst all the other colors, but it is important that you know that those other colors are out there. So I'm going to go ahead and untap this, because I don't have anything that I can play with that mana cost. And if if I go ahead and tap it again and add this to my mana pool, again, this is just a little counters that I can use to help me know how much mana that I can use to play cards during this turn. Right. So I have one in the green pool. If you look at this card, like, for example, the Ordinary Survivalist, his mana cost is up here. And this means that he needs one green mana and one mana, one colorless mana. A colorless mana is a mana of any color. So, for example, if I had a Plains out, I could tap both the Plains and the Forest, which would give me one white and one green. And that would allow me to play Ornery Survivalist. I'd like to throw this out just real quick. We did mention that there are five colors. There's green, red, black, blue, and white. Green uh, is generally forests that give out green mana. Red is going to be mountains. Black will be swamps. Uh, Blue is going to be islands. And white is going to be plains. So when you see, like you'll notice here in, uh, in Nelson's hand, he's got some plains cards. Those are going to be sources of white mana. Okay. Yep. And then um, old, older cards actually had a little tap. I, yeah, we'll explain that later, I guess, once we know what activated abilities are. But um, yeah, so at this point, I don't have any cards in my hand that I can play with the amount of land that I have available to produce mana. Well, I have a question. So how many cards can oh, you put yeah. out? I mean, can you put all of your, your two planes out now? or? Unfortunately, well, you can only, unless otherwise specified, and that's going to be the disclaimer on every single thing I say. Back to the golden rule. Sure. Um, you can only play one land per turn. Okay. And you can only play that land during either of your main phases. Perfect. Okay. So because I don't have any creatures out, we're going to skip combat. And then because I have nothing to play, I'm going to skip my second main phase. I'm going to skip my... Well, I'm pretty much just going to go to my end of turn step. And then... This is just like a this is a placeholder for thing for cards that have abilities that say at the end of turn do blah. This is where those would happen. And then I'm going to clean up, which is just another kind of Actually, let's take a, l- a moment look at that. It says discard down to maximum hand size. Oh, That's yeah, seven yeah, yeah. cards by the way. So you're allowed to have up to seven cards in your hand. I do want to throw this out. And this I hope you all understand this is just kind of a common sense rule for any of these games. But generally, if you're playing a game like this with your friends, you may 
uh, flex the rules around. The well, reason I'm bringing this up is I've played Magic with some buddies, and we've uh, mutually agreed that we wanted to have eight card hands. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not like the magic police are going to come knocking on your door. So if you're playing this in the comfort of your own home and you want to change that kind of thing down, uh, by all means, do it. But generally speaking, in terms of the rules, it's seven cards to a hand. So we discard down to our maximum hand size. All damage is removed from permanence. What does that mean? Well, I'll give you a quick overview, and if you forget it, that's fine. It'll become important a little later. Uh, if I have a creature who can absorb three points of damage, like he's got three life, and he takes two points of damage in that, that phase, he's not dead. He had three, he only lost two. At this phase of, of the turn, he loses all that damage. So it's kind of like he regenerates back up to full health. Gotcha. There are some card games out there where that doesn't happen. Right. Where if you, uh, you know, if you, if you have a creature that has three health and he takes one damage, he's just lost that. And he's now, you know, one, one bit weaker. That's not the way magic works. If you're going to kill somebody, you got to kill them all in one turn. Uh, if uh, a something, and this is just generic, if a something is triggered one or two, uh, it actually goes on the stack and then resolves now since one and two happen immediately without going on the stack. We haven't talked about the stack yet. As we get deeper into the game, the stack will become more important. Uh, if you're a 3DS Max user, you're already vaguely familiar, I promise. Uh, if something triggered, players may play spells and abilities, and then the cleanup step starts over again. Basically, something might happen in this step. Some card ability might cause anything to happen. It might say, you know, you now lose three health, but you might have a special kind of spell called an instant, which can be played at any time, which maybe saves you at the last moment. And you could cast that right now to save your, you know, save your butt from whatever was about to happen. And then our cleanup step would start over. Basically, that's going that cycle is going to rinse and repeat until everything is done. And it's time for Nelson's turn to be officially over. Okay. That sound, and, and all of this description makes it sound a lot more complicated than it really is. I, I do want to point out that during a normal tournament play or during a normal play between two people who have played the game before, you usually don't explicitly define your steps. Um, it's usually all implicit. You know, you, you draw a card, you untap, well, you untap your permanence, you draw a card, you play your cards. You don't explicitly say, this is my first main phase, this is my combat phase. And so I just want to point that out. That's, yeah. If you're just getting started and you want to do that just to help you kind of anchor the rules down, rock on. But that's that goes back to what I was saying earlier on where I mentioned that all of these buttons in here, I never use them. Mm -hmm. Because all they are is cycling through the various phases that I take for granted now. Right. Right. Okay. And then, uh, first of all, per oh, I, I want to define yeah. permanent real fast. Um, permanent is anything, a permanent is any card that exists on the battlefield and stays there. Okay. So, like, um, his, so his example, land his card is a permanent. Is permanent. Yeah. His force is a permanent. If, he, if we put out a creature, that'll be a permanent. If you have an enchantment that stays on the battlefield, that will be a permanent. Okay. Uh, but so. an instant or a sorcery are not permanent, so we'll see about, about those later. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pass turn to you. Okay, and what I'm going to do, and really the only reason I'm doing this, Nelson, is just because it's so much faster than having to reveal all my cards all the time. Uh, is Okay, so here's my screen, and of course I can't see anymore what Nelson is holding, which makes it like a real card game. Now, my first step is to untap anything. I don't have anything tapped, so that's irrelevant. My next step is my upkeep step. Uh, at the beginning of the upkeep, check for triggered abilities, then players may play spells and abilities. Uh, now, upkeep is... Uh, some cards will actually say, uh, during your upkeep step, do this. And since I don't have any cards, that's going to be irrelevant. Our next step is to draw. Now, I can double-click this, and that will draw a card for me. Okay. Alternatively, I could have double-clicked on my deck. Uh, and because, again, I don't use these buttons very much, generally when I'm just playing this, I'll just go double-click my deck and be just fine with that. Now, uh, let's see, I've got some lands, I've got, uh, some, I've got an artifact here. Uh, you'll notice that all, if you take a look at its casting cost in the upper right-hand corner of the card, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, uh, this artifact, Howling Mine, takes just two colorless mana. It means I could, uh, I could use any color land I wanted to. It doesn't have to be a forest any or plant. Mana. I'm sorry? Any color mana. Any color mana, thank you. Uh, now, if we take a look at the, the cards that I have... I've got some special types of land. I remember earlier I said that, you know, green was forests, red was mountains, black was swamps, blue was islands, and white was plains. Well, take a look at this. I got some kind of unique ones here. I've got uh, Halimar Depths land. When you see these, it's probably a good idea to stop and just read what it says. Halimar Depths enters the battlefield tapped. When Halimar Depths enters the battlefield, look at the top three cards of your library, then put them back in any order. 
you may also choose to tap this to add blue to your mana pool. So for all intents and purposes, aside from this little special ability here, this is just like a, an island card. So let's go ahead and bring it into play, just to do something a little different than mm -hmm. what Nelson did. I'm just going to drag it out here. Now, I like playing my land cards right here in front of me, and I'll branch out from that. It's just personal preference. Now, again, it says it enters the battlefield tapped. If this were a game, if instead of just being the workstation, if this really were a game that was implementing the rules, as soon as this came in, it would tap itself. But I had to do that manually. I just double click it and now it's tapped. It's turned sideways. What that means right now is that this is occupied. Think of the word tapped, not like tapping a desk, but like, you know, you're tapped out. You have no energy. There, there's nothing else you can do. So right now, this card is more or less off limits. But I do have this ability on it. It says when it enters the battlefield, look at the top three cards of your library, then put them back in any order. Now, of course, in the real world, that's very easy. Yeah. <laughs> in the in uh, Magic Workstation, it can be done. You just got to know how to do it. If I right-click on my library stack over here, it says top cards of my library. So if we select that, it'll say, well, how many cards? Well, the, the uh, card over here instructed us to get three. So I say three. Press enter, and it shows us the top three cards. Now I can use I can move these up and down to change them to anything I want. So I could take uh, the Halamar Excavator if I wanted to, and I could scoot that up. And then we could take Explore and move that down, and there's the new order. When I'm done, just click close. Cool. So I've now I've put out my one land, which is all I can really do. It's tapped. I can't cast anything because it basically it's done. It, it's tied up at the moment. So really, there's an, all of these other phases right now are irrelevant. I, I can't attack. I, I can't do anything else. My upkeep phase is going to be very boring. So let's just go ahead and hand right back off to Nelson. Okay. I would have put the Explorer at the top. Yep, and I'm going to move my screen out of the way, and now it's Nelson's turn. Okay, so I have nothing to untap. I have not, no activated abilities that happen during my upkeep, and I get a Nazgul card. So I double-click on that. And then I see... Uh, this is the card that I just drew, and he requires two white, so I can't play him this turn because I only have uh, one forest out. I'm going to go ahead and play a plains because this is my one land for the turn. And remember, I'm in my maid phase, so I can play cards my one land. And now I'm going to show an example of a creature being played, and particularly a creature that has an interesting ability attached to him. So the first step is I'm going to clear that out because that was from last turn. Um, just quick note, your mana pool, um, Jason, you might have, because I accidentally left that one right. there when I tapped it previously, this actually gets uh, drained at the end of a turn. Okay. And like everything and, else in Magic Workstation, that's just a manual counter that you yeah. have to physically play with. It's not attached to any rules. And I do want to point out, at any turn, your mana pool is emptied. So, for example, if I were to um, tap my lands during his turn to play a spell, and then I didn't use all my mana... At the end of his turn, my mana would no longer be there okay. in the mana pool. So I'm going to go ahead and tap my forest and plains, which is going to give me one white and one green mana in my mana pool. So now I can now play. Now I can now now I can play Ornery Survivalist because his cost is one colorless and one green. So I'm going to play him, and then I'm going to decrement these from my mana pool. Now, what's interesting about this guy is he's a creature. But he is a subtype of creature introduced in the Zendikar set called, and Zendikar is just one of the expansion sets that have come out in Magic. Um, he's a creature of subtype ally. And pretty much every ally creature, and this is an ally deck, um, they have these abilities that are triggered usually whenever an ally comes into play or when this card comes into play. So if you read his card text, whenever Ornery Survivalist or another ally enters the battlefield under your control, you may put a 1-1 one, one counter on Ornery Survivalist. So this means not only when he comes into the battlefield under my control, when any other ally comes into the battlefield under my control, he also gets a 1-1 one, one counter. Now, now I'm going to pause you for just a minute, and I'm going to break down some of the things that you said in, in that real quick deluge of words. Uh, you said that this was a creature with the subtype of ally. If yeah, He's pointing out right now, right in the middle of the card, it actually shows you this is a creature, and then it has its subtype. It's important to know that because there are certain spells and abilities which will say, do this to all allies. So that subtype becomes very important. He also mentioned that this was an ally deck. So you might be thinking, what does that mean? Basically, all that means is that the deck that Nelson is using is proliferated with a lot of these ally cards. He is using the strengths of these ally cards. Now, he also said in the text that you may put a plus one, plus one yes. counter on Orin Reef Survivalist. Would you like to talk a little bit about the significance of that? 
Well, you notice that there's a little 1-1 one, one down here in the right corner of a creature. That is the power and toughness of a creature. The power is how much damage he deals during combat, and we'll talk about that once I get to a combat step. The toughness is once this number reaches zero, the card gets dis he gets discarded and goes to my graveyard. And this was what Zach was talking about during the um, the uh, one of the ending phases, one over. There you go. Um, where all damage is removed from cards during this phase, and that is included. That that's basically this tough. It's talking about this toughness right now. So once this toughness goes down to zero, he dies. But at the end of my turn, his toughness resets back to whatever it says on the card, in addition to any other altering aspects I might have on this card. And one of those ways to alter a creature is with plus one plus one counters. And just like the name suggests, plus one plus one counters are just counters that you put on this card that augment his power and toughness by, in this case, one and one. Now, when you're um, playing this in the real world, you can use anything as a counter. It could be a, a lot of magic players keep a little bag of glass beads with them at, you know, at all times, and okay. you can just place those counters right on top of your cards. Okay. Uh, with this deck that Nelson's using, you'd need a great big bag of beads. Oh, yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah, like I said, I used to play I used to play a lot of ally decks at tournaments, and I always uh, carried around two of those little boxes of 3x3x3 three by three by three of six-sided die. Yeah. And I used to put a little die on each of my allies who get counters. And that sounds so annoying. Hey, Nelson, let's pause for just a second. I'll explain. Okay, so we've resumed. Thanks a lot, Nelson. Basically, I just dropped his call, called Nelson back so that we have a much cleaner connection. So back to you, Nelson. All righty. So his ability, and Zach, stop me if I'm going in too much depth at this particular moment. But or, his ability... Well, I could just explain it so you don't. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, go no, ahead, please. Explain it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just tease you. When he comes, in, when this when this ability activates, and this is an ability I activate, so it's a triggered ability that's triggered based off the conditions outlined in this card. This effect of him getting a one-one counter goes onto what's called the stack, and the stack is basically the current things that are going to happen. And the cool thing in Magic is that you can play activated abilities and instant cards, and you can put those on top of the current stack. And they'll actually happen before that ability on the bottom of the stack happens. So, for example, let's say Zach had an instant in his hand, and he had the mana to play it, that dealt one damage to my Ornery Survivalist. And he said, in response to... Orin Reef Survivalist entering the battlefield, I cast this spell that decrements his toughness by one. What would happen? Well, he would die because the stack goes to the most recent thing first. So exactly. you're... Uh, did you say exactly or did you say my name? No, you said exactly. No, exactly. Okay, yeah, sometimes I can't tell. Uh, so, uh, again, we'd have the ability that was called in the card, which would be to put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature. Then on top of that, we'd have my little ability, or my little spell, which took away one of his toughness. So, so the stat goes with the most recent thing first. That takes away one of his toughness. This card is now dead. The next thing on the stack was to add this plus one, plus one, but the card is now gone, so that last thing just fizzles. Okay. Yep. Now, uh, before we go any further, I do want to mention this little subtlety, this little nuance. Right now, this is a creature. During the, the yeah. transcendental seconds when Nelson was actually getting this guy into play, he actually starts off as a spell. You bring creatures into the battlefield by summoning them. And I have finger quotes when I say that. I'm summoning a And creature. that's why we have that cost of one and one. One green, one neutral. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You're, okay. you're, that's why it costs mana. Now that makes sense. Exactly. Because okay. you might be thinking, why does it cost mana to get somebody to walk out onto the battlefield? Exactly. Because you're not getting him to walk out onto the battlefield. You're, you're conjuring him from thin air. Awesome. Okay, that makes sense. Now, the reason that's important is because uh, in my deck, uh, now I don't have any in my hand, so I'm not even going to bother bringing my screen back over here. In my deck, I have a lot of control cards that are counter spells. That will say, whatever, whatever spell you just cast, fizzle it. It just goes away. Even though this guy's a creature, as Nelson is bringing him into play, that's still considered a conjuring spell. I can fizzle that conjuring spell and kill this guy no matter what his strength and toughness. Hmm. He just okay. basically, it's like he never actually made it onto the battlefield. Nelson started to cast the spell, and I flicked him in the nose at just the critical moment where that guy just didn't make it in. Gotcha. Okay. 
So it's just something to keep in mind because later on, once we get deeper into this deck, I've, I may very well do that, and you guys need to know that that's okay. Okay. And um, also explaining the stack is important because I'm going to be asking Zach a lot, be- particularly because he's playing a control deck, is whenever I do something, before I start adding counters and giving myself life and doing all the other crazy, thing that, crazy things that allies do, I'm going to usually ask him, do you have any responses after I play an ally? Yeah, and, and I very well might say, yeah, I'm not going to let you do that because I have a counter spell of some sort. And there's a lot of different types of counter spells. I'm using the term counter spell very generically, uh, which will shut down whatever it is he's trying to do. That is the type of deck that I'm playing. Where Nelson told you earlier that he's playing an ally deck, which uh, utilizes a lot of these ally types of creatures. I'm using a control deck, which has a lot of spells which lock down the dude on the other side of the table, preventing him from doing just about anything. But now, just so that I don't get confused, here because uh-huh. I'm starting to a little bit. So he can do something and you can have a response while it's still in his turn. So you're yes, yes, okay. and it's critical to know that. Uh, now I'm gonna, I'm just kind of looking at my cards. I realize you guys can't see them. Actually, yeah, hang on just a second, guys. I'm gonna, uh, Nelson, don't move. I'm gonna bring my table over. I have a card in my hand right now called Fog. Notice that its type is an instant. An instant can be played at any time hmm. your okay. turn, their turn, anybody's gotcha. turn. Gotcha. At any phase of that turn. Now, check out what it does. It says prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn. This means Nelson could attack me. And right before all of that damage starts to hit, starts to be tabulated on my my player, on me, Mm -hmm. I could, if I had the the green mana and this card in my hand, I could tap a green mana and I could just, well, you you declare it first, just as a, uh, you know, to be polite. Say, I'm going to play an instant. I tap my green mana, I bring out my fog, and that goes on top of the stack before all of the damage. Boom. This ability plays, prevents all combat damage that would be dealt this turn. All of his attacks basically amount to nothing. Okay. Again, another aspect of a control deck. Gotcha. Alrighty, so we've had his 1-1 uh, counter ability on the stack for a while, so I'm going to go ahead, because <laughs> Zach has no responses, I'm going to go ahead and add a counter. So I'm going to right-click this dude and say add counter. And that's just a little one. And then it, it's like... you got to keep it is, in your mind, basically. That that, that, yeah, you that, that one means that. he's getting plus one, plus one. Right. So <laughs> whenever you see a card with a counter on it, you're always going to want to um, look at the card and see what counters he can get on him. Now, mm-hmm. I, I realize it's already taken us over a half an hour just to get to like uh, you know the, the simplest part of the first couple of turns. But I do want to mention one more important aspect of bringing out a creature. The first time you, uh, when you first bring a creature out into play, he yeah. has what is called summoning sickness. Again, it's reiterating the fact that he was just summoned into battle. In some other card games, this is known as exhaustion. Okay. Uh, that a you know, character will come in being exhausted. Uh, this means he, uh, that Nelson cannot attack with this character or do anything meaningful with this character until the end of his turn. I cannot tap, or he, I, essentially I can't tap him. He can't tap him. I can't him. do anything that requires to tap requires tapping him, which includes you know abilities or a combat. So I like just because he he did bring him into uh, into the battlefield on this turn. Essentially, the simplest way to look at it is you can't attack with a creature when it first comes in. Now, what's the golden rule of magic? Well, of course, there's always an exception. That, that, that if, the card, if the card says it, it supersedes the rules. That's right. There are some cards out there that have an ability called haste. Particularly ha- red cards. Yeah, haste. Uh, if you see any card that says the word haste on it, that means it can attack as soon as it comes into play. I just want to go ahead and mention that just as, as an example. So he's brought out this Orin Reef survivalist. He got his plus one, plus one counter, but that guy has summoning sickness, and he can't really do anything. I'm thinking your turn's about up, Nelson. Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and skip all these phases because I have nothing to do with them. So, pass turn. All right, and I'm going to bring my screen over. And there we go. Now, first thing, my untap step. Remember, my Halimar Depths came in tapped. So, first step, double click, boom, untapped. Excellent. Now, time to draw a card. Well, right now it's my upkeep step, but I don't have anything with an upkeep step that's meaningful, so we can skip over that. Double-click my draw step, and I get a new card. Oh, could you scroll all the way down over in the, yeah, that window? Thank you. There you go. And I drew another Halimar Excavator. If you remember, I actually put that uh, into a particular order on my library just a moment ago. Okay, so I don't really have enough mana to do anything fun just yet. 
So uh, I need to bring out another land card. Now you'll notice I've still got a couple of these uh, special land cards that come into the battle, uh, come onto the battlefield tapped. While those are great, uh, when you put those out, of course, that's a whole turn where you can't do anything. So I'm going to bring out a forest because I happen to have one. I'm going to tap it and tap it. So forest uh, land cards are not, they don't get summoning sickness. I can tap those as soon as they come in. Okay. That's the idea. And I'm going to summon an artifact called Howling Mine. Now, if we take a look at the ability, it says at the beginning of each player's draw step, if the Howling Mine is untapped, that player draws an additional card. So as long as this guy is not tapped, we draw two cards at the begin uh, during our draw phase. That's okay. what this means. It'll probably end up helping Nelson a lot more than it helps me, but we're gonna, I'm going to throw it out there anyway just in, as an example. Okay. Now, you'll notice this guy costs two colorless mana to bring into play, meaning it doesn't matter really what type of mana I use. As long as I have two of them, I'm good to go. Uh, you can use, uh, I could have ca used three if I'd wanted to. Uh, any extra mana that you have in your mana pool just fizzles and doesn't do anything. Okay. You just ha you do have to watch out for that, though, because if later on I wanted to cast an instant and I had some extra mana that I'd blown through for no reason, uh, I've just I've tapped out my reserves, basically, and I, I don't have that ability. So try to be careful about what's in your mana pool. And if you're just starting out, by all means, use these little counters to kind of help you see what you should be doing. Okay, so that's really all I can do. Uh, I have, no, like, all these other faces, again, are irrelevant. I'm just going to hand off to Nelson, and I'm going to move my screen out of the way. Okay. I really like the artwork on the Howling Mine. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Personal. I also wanted to point this out to you earlier. This is the uh, land artwork for the unglued and unhinged sets. Oh, cool. It's really awesome. But, yeah, okay, first step, untap. Second step, upkeep, nothing to do. Third step, draw. So I double-click. And actually, that's, that was an awesome draw. Uh, it kind of was. Actually, hold on. I need to draw another card, too. Because yep. of the Howling You're Mine. supposed to draw a second card. That's right. Okay. So, well, what I'm going to do in my first combat phase, or my first main phase, is I'm going to play a Planes. Oh, never mind. I can't do what I wanted to. Ugh. Anyway. I do want to mention this. You know, the card did say you're supposed to draw another card. We're all human here, and uh, because this... A system we're using, Magic Workstation, doesn't uh, employ rules, making it very much like a real card game. Uh, you might forget to draw that second card. Generally, there are a variety of penalties for that. If you're in a tournament, it could mean that you forfeit the game. Uh, what In a friendly game, it just means you just forgot and you don't do it. Right. And you'll notice that there, the wording is very important. This doesn't say that player may draw an additional card. This player, this card says that player does draw an additional That's card. That's true. There's a there's a difference between yeah. the two. You will see some cards that say you may do this or you may do that. And there's a difference between may and must, just like in the real English language. Just like on this, if I forget an ally counter, that doesn't, that doesn't impact the game. That doesn't make the game invalid because this is a may ability. Yep. If you forgot, you just forgot. Now move on. Yep. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap two planes to get two white mana in my mana pool. And then I'm going to cast... Con uh, Kazandu. Kazandu Blade Blade Master, and I'm going to put him to play. Double click, and now what happens is now that he's in play and he entered the battlefield, and I don't think Zach has any responses because he's all tapped. I'm out. tapped out. I have no mana. Um, these abilities proc, meaning they go onto this. When I say proc, I mean goes onto the stack. When I say resolve, I mean it has happened. It unwinds so from these, the stack. So these two abilities have procced. I'm going to go ahead and um, resolve them because there's no responses that could possibly happen by right-clicking and adding a counter to him. And if we read the text of my Blade Master, um, I'm going to ignore First Strike and Vigilance for now. Um, whenever Blade Master or another ally enters the battlefield under your control, you may put in a 1-1 counter on Blade Master. Just so, like the other sure. guy. Yep. And now he has Summoning Sickness, so I can't attack within this turn. Now, First Strike is a little bit Actually, I'm going to explain both of these after I get through my combat phase, which I can now execute because I have a creature that no longer, that doesn't have summoning sickness at this moment, and that's my ordinary survivalist. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of my main phase because I no longer have anything that I can do. Um, my Hot Up Freeblade, I wish I could play because he only ha requires one white mana, but unfortunately I only have a forest untapped, and I needed to tap both of these planes to play my Blade Master. So that was close to being able to play two allies in this turn, but not quite. 
So I'm going to go ahead and enter my combat step. The first part of the combat step is to declare your attackers. And so I'm going to go ahead and say this guy. And when I'm actually playing this like on a table, what I'll do is I'll have the, all these guys in a line. And when I declare an attacker, I'll just push the card forward just a little bit, just slide him forward. So the opponent knows who I'm declaring an attacker as. And when you declare an attacker, you can target any player or, uh, I don't want to say this word, but I have to, or a Planeswalker, which is another type of card that we won't be Yeah, we don't have any Planeswalkers in our deck, so you can, you, you can hear that we said that, but now ignore that. Basically, you can attack other players. Right, and I'm going to just outline that by saying I'm going to attack you. Now, how did you just do that? I held down the right mouse button, and I dragged from him to you. Okay. Now, again, no rules are implemented in this very simple game. I have no response to this guy. But take another look at his abilities. He's a 1-1 a one, one creature, meaning he deals 1 damage. He can absorb 1 damage. But he has 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on him. Quick bit of math says he's now a 3-3 three, three creature. So he can deal 3 points of damage. He can absorb 3 points of damage. He has no reason to absorb. He gets a free hit. So I'm just going to right-click on my avatar icon over here. Now, you guys can't see what I'm doing, so I'm just going to bring the, just the edge of my screen in. You'll notice he's, I'm also getting a red arrow on my side. And I'm going to right-click on myself and choose negative three. Pink. And now I'm down to 17. Okay. okay. And we're going to... You actually did skip huh, um, the, the declare blockers, which is being skipped because you'd have no blockers. Then the combat damage step is what we just did. And then the end of combat step, which is kind of a bogus phase that doesn't do anything. <laughs> so now I'm on my second main phase again. Or my second main phase. And um, this would be if there's any other spells or anything you want to cast now that combat is over. Oh, I do want to point out that I just made a mistake. After, when he attacks, he becomes tapped. Okay. I just wanted to point that out. And when you, uh, sort of just a quick example of what, why is that significant, is that when you are blocking, you can't block with a tapped creature. So he, if both my creatures were tapped, if he had attacker, he could just walk right through. And I don't know if we're going to be getting any defenders in this particular game, but... We'll talk about that later. I think I can now bring I wanna... one out. Okay. Um, now I want to point out... Uh, uh, just real uh, quick, I, I'm just going to drive home what you're getting at there. If you attack, you will not be able to block. Right. Because yes. you're tapped with, out. That's just a simple way to look at it. And what's the golden rule of magic? Unless the card says otherwise. And this, you have a great example of it right here with the ability Vigilance. You remember uh, I mentioned the, the ability Haste earlier mm -hmm. on? The ability Vigilance means that a character does not tap when attacking. So, this guy could attack without tapping, meaning that later on, he can still tap to block. Gotcha. So, it, it's a lot of rules to keep in mind, but that's, that's what it is. And we'll talk about first strike once we get... Uh, when we get some creature-on-creature creature action. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pass turn. All right, I'm going to bring my play table over and expand it. And, all right, so uh, first thing, untap, because that's important. Now it's time for my upkeep. I have nothing important that could go on during my upkeep phase, so it's time for me to draw a card. Remember, my Howling Mine is still in play, and it says I have to draw an additional card. So I'm just going to double-click my stack and double-click it again, and now I have two new cards. Now, uh, I can play one land this round, as we've already seen, so I'm going to drag a forest into play. And uh, you're, take a look at my Halamar Depths. I can tap this to add one blue mana to my mana pool. I'm going to do that. Double click on it, and just to use my counter so you see what I'm doing, there's one blue mana in my mana pool. I'll double click on my forest, and that's going to add a green mana to my mana pool, which is irrelevant. I don't care what color it is. I'm going to summon a Halamar Excavator. Now, this is a creature. It's a human wizard uh, ally, so it is an ally card, just like the ally cards he's playing. Whenever Halamar Excavator or another ally enters the battlefield under your control, target player puts the top X cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard, where X is the number of allies you control. It's a lot of words to say, I have one ally in play, so he needs to take the top card of his library and put it in the graveyard. If I had two of these guys in play, he would take the top two cards off his library and put them in the graveyard. Top four. Or top four. Because it would be two. Because proc. they would both proc. And gotcha. that, that's where you got to start really kind of thinking about it. When I, when I put like a second guy out here, then this guy's ability will proc, and the other guy's ability will proc two. So it'll be two, and then another two. So he'd actually lose four cards Whoa. that way. Okay. Oh, don't worry. The, we ran into a situation <laughs> with these decks last night where we were having to whip out calculators and do higher math. 
Good heavens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do want to. I do want to point out. We haven't. I can't believe we haven't actually said this yet, Zach. What's that? The two ways you can win the game. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we haven't really talked much about win conditions just yet. Yeah, if your if your life goes down to zero, you lose. If you run out of cards in your library, you lose. Makes sense, of course. So you, if you're like, th there is a type of deck out there. It's kind of old school. I don't know if anybody plays them anymore. Called an attrition deck, mm -hmm. where you basically fill your library with cards that force your your opponent to remove cards from their library and put them in their graveyard. Gotcha. So, and, which is great, unless you come up with that geek who really does have like a library of four hundred cards, and then he just laughs at you the whole time. Well, that, yeah, that's called a. Um, I've heard it referred to as a mill deck. And technically, if you want to call if you want to call this green blue control deck anything, it is technically a mill deck because of its one particular win condition. But I, I, that's irrelevant right now. Okay, so um, I brought out a Halimar excavator. It does have summoning sickness. There's not much I can do with it, so I can't declare a combat Hold phase. On. I have to discard a card. How do I, where's... Yes, you do. You need to right-click on... Actually, let me give you your screen back so you can show everybody how you do that. So we're back on Nelson's uh, system. And then I'm going to say put card to graveyard. I'm right-clicking on my uh, library. I'm saying put card to graveyard. Mm -hmm. And then I just... He just milled a forest. So there you go. Now, uh, let's see, that pretty much wraps up my turn, so what I'm going to do is bring my little uh, my, my screen back over. I can't declare attackers. All this combat stuff is irrelevant. All of this other stuff is also pretty irrelevant. I'm just going to go ahead and end my turn and get my screen out of the way, because now it's time for Nelson to play. Okay. And I do want to point out one thing. The, uh, the win condition, the second win condition, isn't actually when your library reaches zero cards. It's when you go to draw, and you are mandated to draw, and you physically can't. That means if, if Zach managed to have me draw 50 cards right now, I would lose right now. Because, well, 51, 51. cards, yeah, I it... would lose right now. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. Okay, first step is I'm going to untap everything. I'm going to just double-click on my draw phase twice because of the Howling Mines. I've got two planes. Ugh. And I'm going to, because I'm on my main phase, I'm going to put a planes into play. And then I'm going to go ahead, and this is the kind of the thought process that's going on in my head right now. Zach is playing a mill deck or a control deck, and that means that he has a lot of things that prevent me from doing things. I don't want to waste cards that might get destroyed during while I'm casting them, but I do know that he is currently only has you know, he only has force or he only has one forest available to tap, and all of the cards that do do countering are all blue, meaning they're going to require at least one blue mana. And because he no longer has any blue mana, I'm fairly safe for casting cards. I just wanted to point that out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add one forest and three planes to my mana pool, or one green and three white. And then I'm going to play a card that requires that, the Talus Paladin. So I'm going to double-click on him. He comes out into the battlefield. And at this point, all of my ally abilities proc. So he gets a counter. He gets a counter. And he, if we go ahead and read his text, sorry this picture is blurry for some reason, but whenever Talus Paladin or another ally enters the battlefield under your control, you may have allies you control gain lifelink until end of turn, and you may put a 1-1 counter on Talus Paladin. By the way, if you're new to magic, it does often help to have Google handy. So when they said they gain lifelink, you can immediately jump onto Google and say, type in what in the world is lifelink, and, uh, and there you go. What that yeah. means is that the, whatever damage his characters do uh, in combat this, this turn gets added to his current life. So if I were to do five damage, and if, I were, if, if he had a 1-1 one, one out and I attacked with a 4-4 four, four and he blocked with that 1-1, one, one, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it was a lot of numbers to sling around. Yeah. Um, if I, that's the amount of damage I dealt. I dealt four damage, even though it only took one damage yeah. to destroy that creature. What he, yeah, what he's I, saying is if I have a creature that has a, a toughness of one, meaning he will easily die if he tries to block, even though his little guy here does four damage, it's still considered four damage that he did, even though my guy can only absorb one. Gotcha. It's not like you just take the remainder or anything like that. Yeah, and then because it would lifelink, because... During this turn, all of my uh, allies have lifelink. I would be getting that damage back in the form of life. Well, why don't you go ahead and demonstrate? All right, first I have to add a counter to Mr. Paladin. Mm -hmm. 
And then I'm going to declare my attackers. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to declare my Ornery Survivalist and my Kazandu Blademaster. Okay. And again, I cannot target creatures. I can only target players. Okay. So at this point, um, I'm not going to move to the next uh, declare blocker step because uh, that would invalidate my air awesome arrows I just drew. So at this point, we now are on the phase of the attack step or right. the step of the attack phase where Zach or my opponent can declare blockers and blocker he can declare any number of creatures can block one or any one of his creatures can block one of my creatures okay and let's just go ahead and do that to demonstrate how that works uh, i'm going to say that my halamar and i can well i'll do this on my screen and you can kind of watch what happens on nelson's screen too I can tap my Halimar Excavator, because he has to be tapped to block, and I'm going to say, well, you know what, um, the, which one of these guys is the more powerful? The Oren Reef Survivalist? I mean, this guy's going to die, probably, however it goes anyway, so I, I have to know that going in. But I'm going to block the Oren Reef Survivalist. So that means the only damage that comes through is from our little Blade Master, which 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters plus 1 means 3 damage is what I'm going to take. Once we've agreed to that, I can go ahead and decrement my life once again. And that resolves the combat. Unless yes, uh, I mean, are you you cool with that, Nelson? Yeah, um, yeah. So you yeah, you go ahead and deal one damage to my ordinary survivalist, and I deal four damage to him, and it doesn't go through to you. Right. Yes. Your and your ordinary survivalist. It is important to note he did just take one damage because my little Halimar excavator does one damage. So technically, right now, this guy's a three-four creature. Instead of a 4-4, which is, and I know there's math involved. Uh, but at the end of, uh, of Nelson's turn, he's going to regenerate and go all the way back to full health. The reason it's important right. to know that is that right now, if I had uh, like an instant spell that did three damage to this guy right now, mm -hmm. he would die. And all it would take is three more. But next right. turn, that three wouldn't kill him. Gotcha. Okay, so okay. I've, I've deducted my life. It's time to move on to the next phase. Well, I need to gain, because I have lifelink, I need That's... to gain 4 plus two, 3, which is 7. That's right. So you nice. jump up. Uh, it's pretty now, obvious who's winning right now. Yes, you can have more than 20. No, I was going to ask, so now at this point, the card that took some damage... Is is gone. So what I'm going to do, and here, uh, again, I'll peek just around the corner. Generally, the way I do this is I right-click, and just to save time, because I can say put card to graveyard, or sacrifice, which basically means the same thing. So either one of these, but put card we to... Can... Drop him. Yeah, I can drag and drop him, and now... But this guy, the, do you need to do something to... Uh, if, for the sake of good form, you can, but you do not have to. Okay, because it just seems like it could get to a point where you, you've forgotten what... Um, and what I'm talking about is the damage that Zach did with his one blocker um, back right. to Nelson's card. You know, do, do you, So do you have to mentally start keeping track of all of these other guys... It would help, and it's that would really only be important as things get a lot more complex. But right now, since it all is going to reset, it's not a big deal. That's right. Okay. Uh, now, if, if I was to start slinging out a lot of abilities right now to do damage to him or add some health to my little guy or make him suddenly more powerful, which you can do, mm -hmm. then that becomes a lot more important. Okay. Just because of the fact that once we get to here, his guy is going to regenerate anyhow, right. it's not as important. Okay. Okay, pass turn. Yep. And I'll bring my little table over. Wow, I'm just, I'm getting nothing out in this round. So I'm going to draw my two cards. And uh, let's see, I'm going to untap everything. Now, I did that in, in reverse order. I really should have untapped first before I draw, but, yeah, you know, it's okay. And um, let's see, oh, well, the only thing I have that I can bring out right now uh, are these two special lands. So I'm going to bring out Halimar Depths. And I'll just put it right here. It comes into play tapped, and it allows me to take a look at the top three cards of my library once again. So top cards, we'll say three, and press enter. I'm moving a little bit faster now. And uh, I have Forest, Halimar Depths, and a Fog. And I'm going to rearrange those like so, without telling Nelson how I'm rearranging them. And I'm just going to go ahead and hit Close. And uh, really, that's about all I can do uh, in this in this particular uh, round. So I have nothing to attack. All of the all this stuff over here is perfectly irrelevant. So I'm just going to go ahead and pass turn, and I'm going to get out of everyone's way. All right, I'm going to go ahead and untap all my cards, draw twice. 
And then I'm going to play a forest. Then I'm going to go ahead, and this is, you're probably going to start seeing how my deck was kind of, you know, what the, the idea behind my deck is, or if you haven't already. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tap a forest and a plains to bring out an or, another ornery survivalist. Actually, you're not. Uh, because I have, as I jump into the, into the view real quick, I'm going to declare an instant. I have in my hand an ability called Essence Scatter. You'll notice this is an instant. Counter target creature spell. It's specifically for summoning of creatures. That is what it is for. Now, in order to actually do this, I need one blue mana and one colorless mana. I have Halimar Depths, which if I tap, gives me one... Uh, I need to clear these out. It gives me one blue to my, uh, my mana pool. I can do... Tap a forest, which gives me green, but I'm just going to assume that's colorless because that's what I'm using it for. And I'm going to play Essence Scatter. And, uh, you know, if I want to be really polite, you know, if, if Nelson and I couldn't actually hear each other, I would do that. Just so you know, hey, I'm just targeted that crate. And here's what Nelson would see. So well, this goes on to the stack first. Nelson summons his guy, and all of this stuff is it also goes on to the stack. But my Essence Scatter pops up on top of the stack and actually plays first. So it's kind of like his little Orin Reef survivalist never actually made it onto the battlefield. The funny thing is, is the Essence Scatter also goes on the stack, meaning if I were to play a counterspell, I could counter your counterspell. That's right. And that's why the stack is so critical. I've actually pl seen two control decks go at each other where <laughs> each person is counterspelling and counterspelling and fizzling this and blocking that. And it's just a question. I mean, you've got to sit there and literally go card by card and say, all right, which was it true or false in the end? <laughs> So, uh, with that done, your guy ends up going away. Now, Graveyard. my card also, it's just a, an instant. It doesn't stay on the battlefield. It is not a permanent. So I'm going to right-click on it, and I'm going to say, put to graveyard. It's gone. And it is still Nelson's turn. Alrighty. So then I'm going to go ahead and tap a planes to add one white. And I don't regain the mana from the creature that I didn't successfully cast. Okay. That mana is still gone. Out of my mana. Yeah, and you can't untap those forests either. I mean, that's that's just gone. Right. So I'm going to tap that one planes to give me one white mana in my mana pool, and then I'm going to cast Hot of Freeblade. Okay. And that is going to proc all of my ally abilities. Yeah, because Hot of Freeblade is another ally card. So you start yeah, to then, you start to see why Nelson called this an ally deck. So if you look at his um, ability, whenever Hot of Freeblade or another ally enters the battlefield under your control, you may put a one one counter on Hot of Freeblade. The common theme. So. I'm going to go ahead and add a counter to him, add a counter to him, add a counter to him, and add a counter to him. Okay. And also, I'm going to have all of my allies gain lifelink due to the Talus Paladin. Yeah, ability. go ahead and, yeah, you can see on his, whenever Talus Paladin or another ally enters the battlefield under your control, you may have allies you control gain lifelink until the end of turn. Suddenly, all these guys have lifelink once again, so any damage they do this turn will go into Nelson's life pool. If you're starting to think that this game is really stacked in Nelson's favor, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and declare attackers. We may need to pause and, and reconnect again. All right. Am I... Just now, a little. Keep, keep cruising. Okay, let's go ahead and at least finish this turn off. Now, he's declared his attackers. Obviously, I have nothing to block with, so we bypass any declaration of blockers, and we go right to the damage resolution part of the phase. However, I am going to declare another instant and show off my control deck once again. I am going to tap a single green mana, and I have an instant card called Fog. Prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn. <laughs> So this means that all of this damage does nothing. Now, if you would, kind sir, anybody who should be tapped for the attack, would you please go ahead and uh, tap them? That I, I realize the Kazandu Blade Master doesn't tap, but the other two do. And so those guys are out of commission now, and it's basically for nothing. They, there's no damage dealt. The cool thing about doing that is that uh, that lifelink also goes to nothing. Neither He doesn't do any damage, neither does he gain any life. So that was a really good move on my part. Now, I'm not going to bring my screen back into the, into the view again, but I'm going to right-click on my card and once again choose Put Card to Graveyard, and you'll notice my little fog is going to disappear. Okay. So uh, that pretty much wraps up Nelson's turn. And then I pass to you. All right. Now, my turn again. I'm going to untap everybody. And Do you want to bring yep, it over? Thank you. Time. Thank you. I'm going to untap all my cards and uh, expand. And let's draw two. 
Oh, nice. So um, I get another land card, in this case a forest, which is fantastic. And I'm going to do something kind of, sort of, almost fancy. I'm going to uh, tap a forest and another forest as colorless mana. So let's go ahead and um, I'll show my counters just so everybody is familiar with what I'm doing. And I'm going to cast an ability called Explore. Now this is a sorcery. It's not an instant. That means it can only be played during my main phase, not during uh, Nelson's turn. It has to be an instant if I'm going to play it during Nelson's turn. And it says, you may play an additional land this turn. And it also says, draw a card. So I've got some cards uh, here that I can play. I've got another Halimar Depth. Let's go ahead and bring that out. And that does come into play tapped. So we tap it. And remember, as before, it says, look at the top three cards of your library and put them back in any order. Note that that procs first. That does. Uh, that's what I was about to actually go into. Notice, this says draw a card, but this is just this is still the stack. I played this guy, and now his ability goes on to the stack next. So that comes off first. So I get to look at my, my uh, top three cards again. So top cards of my library. Again, we'll hit three, enter. I can put these in any order I want. Uh, there's one, you can see what's there, and, uh, but Nelson can't. I could really use this card, because uh, I'm, I'm a little short on mana. I'll, it's, it's an island, Nelson. So what I'm going to do is pull that up to the top. I'm going to hit close, and then that unwinds, and now I can uh, draw another card. So double click, and boom, I get that guy right in. So it's a very useful combination. However, we're done with this card now, so let's go ahead and send it back over to the graveyard. It's because a, a sorcery is not permanent. It's just there for the, the duration of the cast. And really, it's there's not much left that I can really do. I think just for the fun of it, I'm going to um, tap... And I'm going to tap, actually, no, I'm going to tap this guy. And I'm going to bring out a Halimar Excavator once again. So if I get rid of the, any mana that I have, what I did is I brought in one blue and what amounted to one colorless, and I've summoned another Halimar Excavator because I happen to have one. Now, whenever he enters the battlefield, uh, Nelson is going to have to take X number of cards from his library and, and throw them away into his graveyard, where X is the number of allies you control. I'm back to controlling only one, so he loses one card off his library yet again. And uh, he, you guys have already seen how to do that. Again, it's just right-click on your stack of cards and, uh, and move those over. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and end my turn. This guy has Summoning Sickness. There's nothing else I can do. Wrap the turn up and move over. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and um, untap all my creatures. And you notice I did discard that uh, planes somewhere. Player played... Uh, Puts planes in graveyard. There you go. Just like no. Um, and then I'm going to click this twice to draw two and play a planes. And I just got some oblivion rings. You did. And these are fun. I love these. O rings. Um, yes, the O rings. Um, and what's cool about them is they're enchantments. And enchantments are kind of like artifacts. Um, Really, the difference between an artifact and enchantment is an artifact is called an artifact and not an enchantment and usually takes colorless mana, unless it's a colored artifact, which has happened. Um, <laughs> so the enchantment does come into play, and it's a permanent, and just kind of sits around. And then it does stuff according to the text on the card. So when Oblivion Ring enters the battlefield, exile another target, non-land permanent. When Oblivion Ring leaves the battlefield, return the exile card to the battlefield under its owner's control. So... That means Oblivion Ring is still in play, but whatever I'm targeting with Oblivion, is no, uh, Oblivion Ring is no longer in play. Meaning you can Oblivion Ring and Oblivion Ring, and you can Oblivion Ring and Oblivion Ring, that's Oblivion Ring and Oblivion <laughs> Ring, and that has happened to me before. Um, <laughs> I was playing the, pretty much virtually the same deck against this other person, and we had a bunch of Oblivion Rings that were, yeah, it was lots of fun. But um, I normally wouldn't do this um, under a normal play, you know, with... But, with Zach, because I know all my creatures can murder that excavator. But I'm just going to go ahead and demonstrate the Oblivion Ring by casting it. And to cast it, I have to pay one planes and two colorless. So I'm going to do that. So I get one green and two colorless. Wait a second, what did I say? One green I and two colorless. One, I want one white and two colorless. Yeah. But, but it, it all amounts to the same thing in this case. Yes. And I'm going to go ahead and cast Oblivion Ring. 
And I know he doesn't have any responses because he only has a forest untapped, which is probably for the fog that's in his hand. Then I'm going to go ahead and um, target Oblivion Ring, or target Holomar Excavator with the Oblivion Ring. So just to, as a, like, like Zach said, as a courtesy to the other player, if we weren't over Skype, I'm just showing him that I'm targeting someone or something with this card. Right. And what happens is, is now this card is exiled. Yeah, and instead of well, that's actually removed from the game, as we mentioned way early on. Nelson? Huh? Okay, for a second, you got real quiet. I thought you had disconnected. Oh, no. So what I'm going to do, just um, uh, usually what I do in a real game is I take the card, I put it over on my side, and then I stick Oblivion Ring on it, and then I put it off the side. So later on, if I had some sort of disenchantment spell to get rid of the Oblivion Ring enchantment, I would get that card back. But in the meantime, Nelson's kind of got it, and it's not doing anything. Now, uh, if you wanted to be all official with the way the uh, the workstation was devised, I would actually add it to my Exile stack. Mm -hmm. But this is actually much easier to follow. Gotcha. Okay, so then I'm going to go ahead and move on, I guess, um, to the combat phase. In which case, I'm going to go ahead and declare all of my creatures as attackers. Okay. And they're all attacking him because that's the only valid target that any of them have. So now it's the it's declare blockers. Which obviously I have so, none. Now, would you please right. tap whoever needs to be at, uh, tapped for attacking? Just for sake of concision. Again, our, our Kandazu Blade Master has uh, vigilance, so he does not tap when attacking, which does mean he can attack and block in the same round, which is great for him. Now, uh, Nelson guessed, and he guessed properly, I'm going to declare an instant. Uh, we see I've got a fog in my hand, so I'm going to tap my forest, bring out a fog once again, and no damage uh, takes place during this round. Which is probably more helpful to Nelson than anything else, because the next time around, he's probably going to be able to bring out another ally, and that ally will have lifelink and so on and so forth, but I'm getting so dangerously low on life that I kind of need to stretch things out and see if my luck will turn in this next couple of draws. So I'm just kind of playing how I have to. Now, on my end, I'm right-clicking that card, and I'm adding it to my graveyard, and you'll see it disappear. And Nelson's turn is pretty much over now. So we, yep. we bring in my table. First thing is I untap everybody. I draw my two cards. And really, all I can do here is play a land, and I happen to have a... Uh, actually, I'm not going to play that one. I'm going to go ahead and play a Kalini Garden. And if you take a look, once again, it's a special land. It enters the battlefield tapped, meaning I can't use it this round, is what that amounts to. When uh, Cal, uh, what, Kalni, thank you, Kalni Garden enters the battlefield, put a 0-1 green plant creature token onto the battlefield. Now, there's a couple of ways to do this. The, the nicest way, right-click, and you have Create Token. Create Token, boom. Now, check this out. We can say, it says Creature Type. It says a Plant Token. So, I actually take a moment, and because, you know, this is a slowish interface, we just have to say, give me a moment. It has a power and toughness of 0, 1, so I type 0, slash, 1, it is a green. Everything you need to know is specified, so we check green. Now, to save me from having to do this later on, ever, I can click Add to the Predefined Tokens list and click Create. And there is my 0-1 creature token. Now, real quick, I'm going to do something just for fun, just to show you guys we can do this. Um, I'm, well, if I sacrifice this guy, he does not go to my graveyard. He's not a card. He's just a token. Okay. I just want to point that out. So if I go back to Recreate him, you actually do have the ability to um, put in your own text onto the card for just because you might think it's fun to do. So if I was to create that, now creature type is not specified. Let me just grab this guy and I can edit him and I can Good thing your other tablets aren't on Jason's computer. Thank you. Um, so we could <laughs> say, uh, Audrey too. Oh yeah. My, my tokens all say amazing things and we'll say create. So now my, you know, you can see you do have some text there. I mentioned that not just because it's fun, but because it actually can be useful in some cases. Okay, so that cleans off that ability, and that is... Hang on, Nelson, what did you have to... You got some bad? Oh, I just, I just wanted to point out a funny story. In a draft once, I won a game with this plant token. I uh, did a... I just cat... I pretty much made a draft deck that made these tokens, and then everything else were enchantments that beefed it up, and I was swinging for, like, 20 in the air at the end of the round. It was brilliant. Anyway. 
You're such a geek. <laughs> okay, so uh, so anyway, with that, I have nothing else I can do. This guy's a zero one. He can't attack because he has no power. So I'm finished. Boom. Oh, yeah. Okay. Alrighty, so I untap my creatures, draw two cards, and I'm gonna go ahead and play a forest. And then I'm gonna go ahead and tap one, two, three, four to play a Talos Paladin. And unless there's any responses to that. Uh, let me look, because I'd love to respond to that. Because really, I'm sick of those things. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, no, I have no response. Okay, I'm going to have all of my uh, allies gain lifelink. And now I'm going to add counters. And then I'm going to move on to my attack phase. Yep. And I'm going to declare my attackers. And then it's time to declare blockers. And um, I'm going to block, let's see, who's the most powerful of them all? Uh, it looks like it's going to be either the Orin Reef Survivalist or this Talus Paladin. It doesn't make much of a difference, really. So uh, what I'm going to do on my end, and I, I can just tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to, now would you please, once again, would you tap all of your characters who are attacking? It just it makes it so much easier for me to see. Usually I tap at the end of the I know, but you shouldn't. Again. Uh, so uh, I'm going to tap my little blocking plant, and okay, I can't apparently... There you go. I right-clicked and chose tap. Double-clicking and wasn't doing anything. And I'm going to choose to block your Orin Reef Survivalist, because that's kind of how you should do it, is right-click on whatever it is you're attacking or blocking and draw a line to it, like we established earlier, Nelson. Uh, so basically we now take the remainder of the damage, which is what? Five plus... Uh, five plus... Ten. Yeah. 12. 12, thank you. And I deduct 12, so I'm getting dangerously close to death now. So, boom, and boom. So I, I drop and 10, and I drop 10 more. Because I have lifelink, I gain 12, and then in addition, the 6, so that's 18. Mm -hmm. So you're saying plus 10, and then plus 8. And then I'm going to bring these guys back to over here, and I'm going to pass turn. Okay. And your plant's dead. And my plant is dead, thank you. So let me let me handle that right here. So I'm just going to right-click and say, put card to graveyard. Goodbye. Now, we'll untap everything. I'm going to draw two cards. And, um... Shoot better not. Oh, dude, I wish I could. Unfortunately, the game's about to be over and I can't. And you already know what I'm uh -huh. thinking. Because it would have been so grand. Um... <laughs> Basically, and, and we're not going to have time to play another one of these games, but uh, there is a card buried somewhere uh, in my deck. If you, Actually, will you uh, humor me if I look at my library for a moment? Would that be all right with you? Uh, no. Okay, well, I'm going to do it anyway, just because this is all for <laughs> educational purposes. Uh, I've been, uh, I, I'm, I'm used to people asking, do you have a problem with me doing something? Yeah. So that's what I was responding so, to. So, uh, check it out. Platinum Angel. Look at this. It's a 4-4 creature with flying... You can't lose the game, and your opponents can't win the game. <laughs> as long as she's in play, I'm basically invulnerable. Nice. Uh, now, here's the great thing. I've got four of these in here, but I got a bad... Oh, three of them? No, I got... F no, there's three in here. But I've got a bad draw. They're all down toward the bottom of the right, stack. Right. Uh, in some of the earlier playtests Nelson and I were doing... Uh, I would get these out really early on, and it would just really irritate Nelson. <laughs> I do it, and actually, guys, I'm actually going to concede the game, because in the next round, all Nelson's got to do is attack, and I have nothing to do to block that with, and I, of course, would lose my last two life, and I think you guys are seeing where this is going. But I want to point out just a few fun little things that we didn't get a chance to do because of that random factor, but take a look at my very next card uh, that would have come up. It's called Rite of Replication. Pretty much the entire win strategy of the game is based around that card. We had a lot of fun with this card. Um, and you can see what it says. It's, uh, first off, ignore the kicker text. We'll talk about that in a moment. Put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of target creature. If we're looking at cards, let me uh, go pull them up on my... Yeah. So you can see the artwork yeah, and stuff. Yeah, uh, if you like. So boom, there, there's what it looks like, and you can see there's a whole bunch of little clones of things coming out. So it says, uh, put a token into the battlefield that's a copy of target creature. If Rite of Replication was kicked, put five of those tokens instead <laughs> of just one. Now, kicker five. What that means is, if I pay my casting cost for this spell, and then an additional five colorless mana, then whatever the kicker ability is gets triggered. Now, here's where it starts to get pretty nifty and why we had to start whipping out calculators last night. 
if I take Nelson's Talus Paladin and I replicate that creature, take a look at his ability really closely. Whenever Talus Paladin or another ally enters the battlefield under your control, you may have allies you control gain lifelink until the end of turn, and you may put a plus one, plus one counter on your Talus Paladin. Now imagine if you put five of these into play at the exact same time. Each one of them would proc five times for each of the five times that each one came out. So the first one comes out, and he gets his plus one, plus one counter. The second one comes out, and he gets his plus one, plus one counter, but the first one gets another plus one, plus one counter. <laughs> the next one comes out, and you repeat yep. this over and over again, and you basically end up with these five ridiculously powerful <laughs> creatures. Wow. Uh, there's another one, uh, Nelson doesn't have it in play right now, but it's in his stack somewhere, where uh, whenever an ally comes into play, you get life equal to the number of, uh, of allies you have in play. And he's going to, yeah, the Andu Cleric. So whenever Andu Cleric or another ally enters the battlefield under your, your control, you may gain life equal to the number of allies you control. If I was to ru uh, cast my Rite of Replication kicked on this guy, <laughs> the same thing happens, and I get about 180 life out of it. <laughs> so I nice. can potentially save myself from the brink of death even at this point. Wow. But because we've been going on for an hour and 15 minutes now, I'm going to go ahead and say, you know, Nelson took me out on this one. Could be because of a bad draw. Could be because he had a really good draw. But for whatever reason, I have lost this game. But this definitely gives me a um, a clear enough vision of what the game is about. Yeah. Such that we could start coding. Absolutely. I also want to reiterate, guys, that an hour and 16 minutes in, there's no way that getting to turn 14 will ever take an hour and 14 minutes. It was only because we were explaining every single little nuance we were sure. doing. Uh, this game would have gone a whole lot faster if we were just playing. Sure. This game was actually a dud. It was actually pretty short. It was. It was. Um, if it hadn't been for all the explaining, this would have just been a few minutes. All right, so Nelson, do you have uh, anything you want to say right now in regards to development? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I've started um, playing around with ideas about how to sort of architect this in a sane way. And the issue with it is that the kind of – the do, can you see my – are you see, looking at my We're looking at your yeah, screen we're looking now. At your my, screen. Mine's moved away. Okay. Um, the graph – of everything is very complex. You know, you have the battlefield, you have the cards that you have in play, the cards the opponent has in play, you have the cards, individual abilities, how many counters they have on them, their graveyards, libraries, and all that sort of right. thing. And, and ideally, so, in a game, all of this would be automated. Right. Right, and, and what I'm saying, though, is that there's a lot to um, kind of graph out and map out in a way that makes querying that data and understanding, you know, how to what's going on at the moment, you know, possible. In addition, there also needs to be a sane way to add cards with abilities. And we discovered very early on that there is no way we're going to be able to write a parser that's going to identify what this text is and turn out something that can be instantly played. Instead, what we're going to have to do is basically write a class for every card that executes all these abilities and provides all of their activated abilities and all the listening abilities and all that stuff and writing the framework that allows us to add those classes quickly and without much any overhead or infrastructure or craft to deal with is also going to be an interesting um, challenge. And then on top of that, we have to sort of figure out how the game can interact with the user interface in a way that isn't tied down to a particular user interface. So we need to figure out how to get the communication between the game and the interface in a way that, well, like I said, that doesn't that doesn't cause any massive amounts of coupling between the two systems because they're going to be vastly different as we move this code around between different front ends. And then on top of that, like I said earlier, we're talking about uh, we're going to build this with the intention of networking, which is another thing we have to take into consideration. So all these things I've been pretty much thinking about, and I have an a pretty it's pretty detailed at this point over or draft of how the architecture is going to be laid out mm -hmm. so yeah all right fantastic so then starting with the uh the next video that we do i guess we can uh, start discussing that and developing yeah awesome all right well i'd like to thank you nelson and you zach for 
given me the uh, the detailed explanations of this game here. And I know there's obviously a there, lot. There's a lot more lot to it. This is like the tip it. of the iceberg. But it does give me a, a good idea of how the different phases work and, and general gameplay. And I am very much looking forward to seeing how this will be put together. So thank you to uh, all of our viewers. And that will wrap up this video. See you in the next.